We welcome everybody once again to our Catholic Studies Night tonight. Our topic, since we're a week away from the holiday of Thanksgiving, a theology of Thanksgiving. You all remember the story our Lord Jesus brought up from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, the story of the ten lepers? Our Lord Jesus himself shows us how much he prizes the virtue of Thanksgiving, of gratitude. Think about it now. Nine of them got healed. Oh, they all got healed, but nine of them just left. Only the one, the foreigner, came back to thank the Lord Jesus. Who doesn't thank God for a miracle? A miracle. And the beautiful thing is, as Catholics, we experience miracles all the time, especially when it comes, of course, to the Holy Eucharist. But also, aren't we taught from an early age to give thanks? I've used this example many times before. I remember how it is when you're a little kid, and a great, a great aunt would come and give you like a, a silver dollar, Okay, you're like, oh, wow, Jerry, you, you're ready to go run and play with it. But what's your mom? Oh, no, no, no. What do you say? It's cool. No, no. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you, right? We're called to, to give thanks. We're taught that from a very early age. Well, thanksgiving, gratitude, it's a response to a gift. Because there's a wide range of gifts. Some are simple. Some are life-changing. Then there's a wide range of levels of gratitude. Like, for example, let's say a couple of months ago, you left your, your cell phone at home. You have to call somebody, so a real kind person lent you their phone. After you were done, you say, hey, thank you, really appreciate it. That was very nice of you, okay? Nice little bit of courtesy. But what about the larger gifts? Life itself, being cured from a sickness, having your sins forgiven. Those demand a far more deeper level of thanksgiving than a simple act of courtesy. Because God's generous presence in our lives always points to a level of gratitude that can never be satisfied with a simple act of thanks. So that's, that, that is very important. It requires us to express our gratitude in action. See, the reason why is because God wants us to have a bond, a friendship with him, so he can then use us over and over again, committed to his service, to go out and bless others. We're grateful, he wants others to be grateful as well. So don't forget, the grateful person is a person that God can use very effectively. So God wants our full gratitude because he wants our continuing full friendship which will allow them to flood us with so many more gifts. But remember this now. Ingratitude, not being thankful, that weakens our bond with God and also our bond with our neighbor. As what St. Bernard once said, ingratitude is like a searing wind which dries up the springs of pity, the dew of mercy, the streams of grace. And ingratitude also leads to spiritual isolation. Thus, thanksgiving, which is actually a victory over selfishness and isolation, is most pleasing to God. God loves a thankful heart. I've mentioned many, many, many times before, especially like in confession or spiritual direction, a generous, grateful, thankful heart, that keeps the doors of heaven open, always for you to receive blessings. In fact, one person once very wisely said, gratitude is the memory of the heart. It's ever an expression of love and abiding friendship. And gratitude is also an expression that soon transforms itself into action. And two ways that we can express our action are through humility, but also restraint. As our good friend G.K. Chesterton once put it, we should thank the good God for beer in Burgundy by not drinking too much beer in Burgundy. In other words, humility and restraint, two ways to put into action a grateful, thankful heart. But remember now, there's no happiness without gratitude. We need to know whom to thank for the gift of life. And everything else that goes with it, especially as Christians. But we also need to thank our Lord in the most proper of ways, to cherish what we have been given. Humility and restraint are the appropriate ways in which we can show how much we truly appreciate what's been given to us. As Archbishop Fulton Sheen once put it, gratitude is characteristic only of the humble. The proud are so impressed by their own importance they take everything given to them as if it were their due. They have no room in their hearts for recollection of the undeserved favors that they received. That being set up, since this is a teaching on the theology of Thanksgiving, let's break down a scripture passage to bring up fully how Thanksgiving is very pleasing to God. So we take a look then at Psalm 107. 107. A psalm summoning us toward Thanksgiving. So I'll hear the opening three verses. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let that be the prayer of the Lord's redeemed, those redeemed from the hand of the foe, those gathered from foreign lands, from east and west and north, 
and so. The psalm opens up with a direct call to give thanks to God. Now, this wonderful psalm, a summons, okay, kind of like a command, to offer up thanksgiving was sung by the Jews, especially sung to thank God for redeeming his people, this whole nation from disaster and captivity, even death. The psalm provides a rich kind of picture of God's divine work of redemption in redeeming the people, restoring the Israel because of his mercy and his goodness. So keep in mind, if you guys know your history there, right? As a nation, Israel was delivered, redeemed, rescued, restored by God through the centuries. Like for example, you just break it down, go to, to the Exodus, the book of Exodus, chapter 12 through 14, you can read about how Israel was redeemed from Egypt to the south. Or go to 2 Kings, chapter 19, and read how Israel was redeemed from Syria and Assyria to the north. Or go to 2 Samuel 8, or 2 Kings 18, and read about how Israel was redeemed from the Philistines to the west. Or go to the book of Ezra, and see how Israel was redeemed by Babylon to the east when they were brought back from Babylonian exile. So literally, verse 3, how the people were gathered in the east, west, north, and south, that actually happened. That was Israel's experience. God has redeemed his people from the hand of the adversary, from their foe, and gathered them from lands in every direction. And all of Israel then had experienced that, either from Egypt or Syria, Syria, the Philistines, Babylon. So this then psalm is a summons to all of Israel to thank God in general for all of his good and merciful deliverance of the nation. But as important as that was for Israel, the psalm calls us to realize God's ability to bring us back from our exile, our personal and spiritual kind of struggle sometimes with sin. So the opening call of this three verses, the psalm after that verse, gets very interesting because there are four illustrations of God's redemption, four illustrations running from verse 4 to verse 32. So first, God's redemption is like a lost caravan being led to a safe city. Next, God's redemption is like a captive prisoner in, in a dungeon waiting execution, being set free. Third, God's redemption is like a sick person with no appetite, on the brink of death, but then recovers to full health. And finally, God's redemption is like a doomed sailor being rescued from a life-threatening storm out there on the sea. These are the four great pictures presented to us in this psalm that illustrate God's redemption. Now, here's what's interesting. Each of the four illustrations has four parts. First of all is the predicament, the bad situation that people find themselves in. Second, we see the petition, the cry for deliverance that came from them. Third, we then see the pardon, the merciful redemption that God will give. And then fourth and finally, we see the praise given in total thanksgiving for all that God has done. So predicament, petition, pardon, and praise. In those, our redemption from sin is also shown in these analogies. So our redemption then is like being lost by being found, locked up in prison but being set free, being sick with a deadly illness but being healed, or life being threatened at the sea, being led to a safe harbor. Each of these provide a look at God's goodness and mercy in very simple but very beautiful terms. Let's then break down now the first one, okay? People lost in the wilderness. So here we meet the restless soul, which describes a whole lot of people, right? A lot of people in their lives are just, just restless. They're just unable to take it easy, okay? Especially in the Lord. And so we do meet, and sometimes it might have been ourselves, people who are drifting, wandering, all around with no particular direction. Restless, aimless, lost sinners, running out of food, spiritually speaking, starving and thirsty, wandering around hopelessly in the desert, trying to find a city that they just can't find. A city that will give them food and water and rest and joy and fellowship and safety. But now we look at the predicament in verses 4 and 5. Some had lost their way in a barren desert, found no path toward a city to live in. They were hungry and thirsty, the life was ebbing away. But then, in verse 6, we come to the sinner's petition. In their distress, they cried to the Lord who rescued them in their peril. Now, historically speaking, Israel cried to the Lord when they were in Egypt. He heard them. He delivered them. Sometimes we're so lost, so caught up in our waywardness, we forget to cry out to the Lord. Israel cried out, even when they were in Babylon, he heard them there and delivered them, like when King Cyrus sent them all back home. 
It told God of their condition. It told God of their oppression. It told God that they were lost. God responded. For us, then, they illustrate the sinners of every age who recognize their aimlessness. We can get lost sometimes, right? Realize just how restless things can really be. Those who realize their spiritual hunger, their thirst for spiritual things, begin to realize the danger of their condition. But then how does God respond? The third point is the pardon. So from, from the predicament to the petition, now comes the pardon. This is verse 7. This is wonderful. It seems to be very simple. It says, He guided them by a direct path so they reached reach a city to live in. Always remember, when the sinner cries to God, he answers. When Israel called to God, he answered. He heard Israel. He brought Israel out of Egypt. He heard the people. He made the way open to them, provided for everything that they needed. Like, for example, giving Nehemiah to be their leader, make sure they were safe, make sure the journey was a straight one, no playing around, back to the inhabited city, Jerusalem. They're able to rebuild and to be restored. And so God is with us. When the sinner comes to him and cries for mercy, that's all it takes. We need to, need to cry out to the Lord and he will respond with a pardon. That's why we have the sacrament of confession. He will give you the grace to go by the straight way. That's pure grace. Pure grace. If everything's all lined up, it's a straight way, you know you're exactly where you need to be. It's very much like when Jesus said, remember he proclaimed, Come on to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So that leads then to the fourth point. That kind of goodness, that kind of grace, that kind of mercy given from God to us, that carries an obligation. And what's the obligation? What's well, verse 8? Let them thank the Lord for his mercy, for the wondrous deeds he does for the children of Adam. God doesn't want you wandering around anymore, but he's not going to force you. Be patient enough to wait for you to call upon him. But don't wait. Cry out. Then once God brings you back to the heavenly Jerusalem, once he brings you back to the church, once he gives you everything that you need, then certainly you are obligated to give him thanks for that great grace. Because let's be honest here, okay? What could deserve more of the thanks of God's people than being led safely to the inhabited city? Because ultimately, what is that? It's heaven. We have a straight path to our home. We just simply stay with the Lord. That's why we have to be extremely grateful. Okay, let's go to the second illustration. That's like being locked in a prison. Now, if the word restless highlighted the first illustration, the word miserable marks the second one. We see people here who are in misery. Sometimes we see people in our lives who are in misery. Now, the predicament is verses 12, 10 to 12. Some lived in darkness and gloom, in prison and misery and chains, because they rebelled against God's word and scorned the counsel of the Most High. He humbled those hearts through hardship. They stumbled with no one to help. What you have here then is someone in prison on death row waiting the upcoming execution. It's dark, it's pitch black. The people here are living in the very shadow of death. They're in chains, unable to move, unable to escape. This is the illustration of any sinner who's in the misery of the dungeon of his or her own making because they rebelled against God, disobeyed God's word, disregarded God's will, found life to be hard, but they made it even harder right, because of their sinfulness or selfishness. And now they're the person stumbling and falling, helpless and in the dark. The sinner is chained to his own crimes. In that condition, though, we come to the verse 13, to the petition. And this is where we all have to come because we're all sinners, right? In their distress, they cry to the Lord, who saved them in their peril. Now, somebody could argue, somebody might say, well, it's probably a hopeless cry. If you live a life like that, you've been a rebel, a no-good sinner against God, you've been wandering in the wilderness of sin, well, what use is it to cry to God? But well, we know better, don't we? We have a Savior who comes to us, especially when we're down and out, to get us out of that prison. Again, Israel cried to God for deliverance, and it came. They went back and rebuilt their land. God can do the same thing with us. As we see in verse 14, He brought them forth from darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains asunder. Our Lord Jesus brings us out of darkness, out of the shadow of death, and breaks the chains that once held us bound. 
That leads into the fourth point in the second illustration, and the means such deliverance means what? That obligation again for praise and thanksgiving. And so we see in verses 15 and 16, let them thank the Lord for his mercy, such wondrous deeds for the children of Adam. You broke down the gates of bronze and snapped the bars of iron. See, the only proper response to the grace of redemption is thanksgiving. So, what do we have so far? Being lost in the wilderness, being locked in a prison. Third, we see those languishing in sickness. Now, verses 17 to 22 gives us another picture of those who are in despair. The person who is sick and depressed. But now, notice something. I've been on a number of sick calls as a priest. You know, the, you, some they go get the last rites, some they go for an anointing of the sick. Those who are close to death, as many of you know yourselves, they begin to have no appetite. Might be for days, maybe for hours, maybe even for weeks. They refuse to eat. As the severity of their illness, their severe near-death illness, results in a loss of appetite. That's what's being pictured here. The predicament in Israel, like a sick person with a fatal disease, and when they were in their Babylonian captivity. Redemption would be like a kind of miracle healing, because they lost all hope. They lost all appetite, spiritually speaking. They don't want to eat. And so spiritually, they were near death. But of course, what do the faithful do? We know the pattern, right? They cry out. Verse 19, in their distress, they cry to the Lord who saved them in their peril. Remember, they were rebellious. They were foolish. And now they're in desperate condition, and so they cry out to the Lord because they're in trouble. And once again, somebody might, cynical might say, well, that's not fair. They messed up, and now the Lord's just going to come and just take care of them? Okay, maybe it's not fair, but that's what the Lord does. He's our Savior. The sinner messes up. Once he realizes his life is a total mess, he's closer to death and life with the Lord, you cry out. And of course we see this wonderful sense of pouring forth life-saving grace in verse 20. He sent forth his word to heal them and snatch them from the grave. No one's better at doing that than our Lord Jesus, snatching us from the grave. Our Lord Jesus desperately wants to save us from that death. Why? Because he was asked. We cried out. That's why we have yet another example of not waiting, of crying out to our Lord Jesus sooner rather than later. He's the Savior. He wants a Savior, so ask him to do so. Now, real quickly, before I go on here, all right, some of you have not fully cried out to the Lord, all right, because you're either too stubborn and too proud or whatever. Then I'll take care of myself. Hey, Lord, you've got other people to take care of, right? You go, well, I want to take care of you, all right? Cry out to him. He's a personal God. Others of you are saying to yourself, man, I cry out every day. I'm always crying, man. And nothing seems to be t taking place here, right? Because who are you crying to? Yourself. You're not crying to God. You're crying to yourself in your little pity party. Oh, okay, no. Cry to the one who's going to save you. Here's an example of that, okay? Back when I used to teach uh, religious education at Queen of Heaven Parish here, okay? I was in my teenage years, all right? This one little girl in the class, was, she was a, in, in one of my students, all right? Her dad was like, he helped out the church. He was kind of a rough guy. We didn't want to mess with him, all right? And she would say to us, kind of teasing us, all right? If any of you boys bother me, I'll just cry to my daddy. He'll come and take care of me. Oh, no. Well, he's probably over here working or whatever, right? And so we thought, a couple of those guys thought, we said, okay, we're going to tease her, man. So we started chasing her. She went, Daddy! Uh, here we go. Whoa, we started running, man, okay? That's what you got to have. Cry out to the Lord in confidence because he's going to be there in a heartbeat for you, right? But for those of us who are Catholic, there's also another point, point to be made here. Sinners, sick with their guilt, sick with their anxiety, or depressed, or troubled, without any appetite for spiritual food, what does our Lord Jesus do? He gives us food to eat. But not just any old food, he gives us himself in the Holy Eucharist. So we can take, we can eat, we can receive the glory and the healing power of God, but then bring us back from sickness to spiritual health. Is there any surprise then that the word Eucharist means thanksgiving? That's no, that's no surprise at all. At least then to the fourth point, the obligation. Verse 21, let them offer a sacrifice and thanks, recount the works and shouts of joy. Where better than to recount all that Jesus has done for us, when he, all this wonderful sense of thanksgiving to him better than at the Mass. 
you go to Mass, you're not thankful there, we'll step outside for a few seconds, get that sense of thanksgiving, and go back in and try it again. We're supposed to be thankful at Mass every time we go. That's what we do when we come together, if you think about it. See, some people don't understand what the church is. It's a group of redeemed sinners that gather together to thank God for their redemption. That's what we are. That's what we do. We are people of thanksgiving. But finally, we see the example of life threatened at a storm at sea. We're also not only like lost people in a caravan or prisoners in a dungeon or sick people on a deathbed. We're like sailors in the midst of a really deadly storm. Restless? Yeah. Miserable? Yeah. Sick? Oh yeah. But now here we see something a lot of people go through as well. Be fear. Fear might get a hold of you. Be fearful, frightened, even terrified. Yeah, life can be tough sometimes. This last illustration portrays the terrors of sinners as they really understand their condition. Because some just drown without even calling out at all. But some realize their condition. So, let's take a look at the predicament in verses 23 to 27. Those who are at sea are tossed about by these great storms, these huge waves. How bad were the waves? This is brilliant writing here in the psalm, okay? In verses 26 and 27, just think about this boat being tossed about, all right? They rose up to the heavens, sank to the depths. Their hearts trembled at the danger. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. Their skill was of no avail. And talk about a roller coaster ride, right? So for those in this situation, there was nowhere to go. There was no solution. Even their skills couldn't, of sailing couldn't help them. They were completely overwhelmed. So ponder this for a second. You can make an argument. There's nothing more frightening than being on a sinking ship, especially during a really, really bad storm. Now, maybe being on an airplane might be terrifying if it's going down, but that wouldn't take very long, would it? This experience would seem like it took forever. Now, apply it historically. The Babylonian captivity seemed like a relentless storm that swept the nation of Israel and threatened to drown it. But most certainly also for the sinner, living apart from God is like being in a storm-tossed sea of terror without any hope. The world, in fact, is a sea to sinners. It's a troubled sea. Temptations, sorrows, sufferings, those are the waves. Heaven is the only safe harbor, and we get there, of course, through the church. But how do we get there in this case? How does heaven come down to us? One more time, we take a look at the petition. Petition of the sinner in verse 28. In their distress, they cry to the Lord, who brought them out of their peril. When they've come to the end of their wits, when all wisdom has been swallowed up, nowhere to turn, we are supposed to cry to our Lord as well. There's no human rescue possible. The only means, then, is to be under the divine. That, of course, is where the sacraments come in, most especially baptism, confession, and the Holy Eucharist. Of course, once we cry out, here comes the pardon, verse 29. He hushed the storm to silence. The waves of the sea were stilled. Jesus comes to us with the glory of heaven to rescue us out of the depths of hell we sometimes find ourselves in during those storms of our lives. So one more time, how could we not offer under deep obligation gratitude and praise, heartfelt thanksgiving for Jesus coming to save us? Our Lord's always coming to our rescue. The people in the caravan, they found the city. People in prison, they were set free. Ones who were sick were made whole. The people in the storm were safely led completely out of the storm, to a safe place. So, for the restless, for the miserable, for the sick, for the fearful, for those knowing, not knowing where they're going, God hears their cry and comes to rescue them. And again, what's our obligation? The last point, praise in verse 31. Let them thank the Lord for his mercy, for his wondrous deeds for the children of Adam. This incredible psalm that reminds us we're called to thanksgiving. We are those people. We are the wanderers. We are the prisoners. We're the sick. The sailors caught in a bad storm. But Jesus comes to rescue all of us. So then, what's the only proper response? Remember that great Catholic hymn of ours? Now thank we all our God, with hearts and hands and voices, whose wondrous deeds have done, in whom his world rejoices. We're called to worship, to give God his due, and part of that is to bring him our thanksgiving. What then should our attitude constantly be? 
constantly? Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. To live our lives, then we live in total and complete attitude of thanksgiving, because in everything, give thanks. And God bless.